Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting Live. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, founder of Thrive Meetings and Events and this podcast. Welcome to February. And according to the groundhog this morning, we're going to have six more weeks of winter. So all, all you, those in Midwest to Northeast, be ready for all of that snow. I'm glad I'm down in North Carolina and we don't have very much. Um, so this morning, I'm excited to have my friend Val DeFord, a registered nurse and public health expert who specializes in making healthcare make sense, which I'm sure all of us have had those challenges with that. She is known for making complicated issues simple and enabling conversations between diverse groups. And Valda, yesterday when we were chatting about you being on here and you're like, well, I don't know about the food tie-in. And then we just started talking for a good 45 minutes about food and, and, and your role in it, you know, as a nurse, but also as a person, as a person. So mm -hmm. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. It's so good to be here. I'm very excited to have you here. And I, you and I connected probably four or five years ago through a women's organization. So we've been chatting for a while now. So I'm glad to have you here. Um, so I want to understand with how do you, one of the things that you said to me is that you work tirelessly, tirelessly to find answers to complex questions, complex questions that really have to do with healthcare. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, for sure. As a registered nurse, and even before I became a nurse, I was the mother of a child born with a heart condition. There seemed to be a big disconnect between what I needed to know and what healthcare providers were either willing to tell me or felt that I would be able to absorb. And later, working in trauma, intensive care, and all over the world, I found that there is a huge chasm between what we need to know as consumers of healthcare and what we get told. So sometimes it's just about us learning to change our language. Healthcare providers are, have bought into jargon many times and it's hard for them to speak like real people. And so I love the idea of finding the words, the conversation, the examples that will make whatever condition make sense. And that makes sense. I mean, having had shoulder surgery two years ago, I mean, a lot of it's over your head and you read the bills and you don't understand what any of that means. And you're getting charged. I didn't know that person in the hospital was a was a contractor. I thought they worked at the hospital. Right. So and then you're getting separate bills from all of them because you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that. It's 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 a big challenge. And, and the fact that you mentioned heart disease, because this is Heart Health Month, you know, how, what did you learn about that going through that entire process with your child? But then also let's talk about it with women as well. Well, heart disease is the number one killer of everyone. Most people think about heart disease and especially heart attack as something that happens to men. We see the stereotypical red face, sweating man clutching his chest, and we think that's what a heart attack looks like. Well, certainly that is not necessarily what it looks like, and specifically not necessarily what it looks like in women. When I was trying to navigate life with my son, I found that many times healthcare providers don't know that we have the capacity to know everything there is, or you know, just try us out. And then these days with Google, you can pretty much find out everything, though. Cautionary warning here, uh, about 85% of healthcare information on the net is junk and is not based on science. It's just someone talking about something. But heart disease, I found specifically, most people don't know what a woman's heart attack look like looks like women are more likely to die even if they present at the emergency room because they're, they don't have that red face sweating clutch chest kind of situation. And women can have just, oh, tiredness and, oh, my shoulder hurts or I'm not sleeping well or I've had a cough. And therefore people at the ER are saying, 
you need to see your primary care provider or you need to see a therapist or at least you need to get out of my face. And unfortunately, <laughs> women are more likely to die because they go home where they've actually had a heart attack and it's been undiagnosed. And of course, time is muscle. So the faster we know it, the more likely we are to save the person and to prevent permanent damage. Well, it just popped into my mind. I remember watching an episode of, I think it's 911 on television. And it was the main character, one of the black women's mom who was older in age had that. And she had those symptoms and she's like having a heart attack. And they took her, no, she's fine. She's not having a heart attack. Yeah. And it took her who just became an EMT to see the signs. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that no healthcare provider in general, of course, there's psychopaths in every profession, unfortunately, but no one is thinking, oh, let me make sure I let this person die when they show up at the ER. Right. But the most important thing is to know yourself and to be very comfortable and confident in saying, no, I do not feel well. Something is really wrong. And will you check a little bit more? And that can sometimes make the difference. We are doing as much as we can to educate all the people who are at those touch points. Please pay attention. Please take the time to do an EKG. EKG takes, these days, it takes longer to put the leads on than to actually run the test. It wow. done in 30 seconds where it used to be a big complicated thing, but now is really simple. Anyone who worries about having heart disease and potentially being at high risk for heart attack should use the thing called Cardia. It's a little fingertip thing. You can use yourself, basically like your phone. And But the most important thing, if you don't feel good, especially if you've been feeling tired for a long time, you have any symptoms of like un, unabating indigestion, just jaw pain. A lot of women have jaw pain. A lot of women have a cough and they don't have any uh, kind of situations. Just say, make sure you're a good historian and say, this has been going on for this amount of time. Even more importantly, know your numbers. Take your blood pressure regularly. Don't let somebody tell you your blood pressure is fine. Know what your numbers are make sure that you know what your resting heart rate is and you're able to take a pulse such that you can see, oh, this is feeling a little strange. And don't take your pulse with your thumb because you're not supposed to. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you need to, check at your carotid artery. It's big and you can feel it really easily. Check for a full minute, but pay attention to the rhythm, mm -hmm. regular to the strength, is it bounding, boom, 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 boom. You can literally feel that. And if you exercise and check it, you can kind of see where it is when you're still versus when you're stressed. And how do you feel? What's your color like? For African-American women, many times uh, because of the melanin in our skin, you may not see the darkness in the lips. So okay. learn to look at the gums. Do the gums. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do the gums look dark? Do you look dusky? Just generally not as vibrant. And sometimes that is what can save your life. Wow. That I had no idea. I mean, because there's so many different touch points that it could have impact you. Mm -hmm. And and I'm hoping that doctors are looking at all those different and or te being taught all those different things to look for as well. Yeah, they definitely are. The problem is there's just a lot to learn. And especially these days, healthcare providers are pretty stressed out. Uh, about 20% of healthcare providers have decided to give up healthcare because they've been working nonstop. They have, they have to stay and do shifts like the law, say in North Carolina for a registered nurse is if I go to work and I'm supposed to get off in eight hours and my replacement doesn't show up, then I am bound by law to stay 16. So, and if I leave, and if I leave my patients in such a way that they are not cared for, then I can lose my license for abandonment. So many people wow. recognize that. Yeah. So you already have unsocial hours. You're working when other people are sleeping. You're working when other people are partying. You're working holidays. And now you have the law 
which is not meant to be punitive and it's not to be something that would typically happen, but COVID has been another situation. And I know my colleagues who are registered nurses are just worn out. So the same thing for the docs, the docs are leaving too. And so that means you have fewer people who are looking after you, fewer, more people who are tired and stressed out and more things that might present like, well, that's probably COVID. And even though COVID is something to deal with, it's not an emergency until such time as it gets bad. So right. make sure that you know yourself and you're willing to speak up for yourself. Uh, that is really, really good advice. I mean, and then actually we were in, I emailed one of the PAs that works at the ER recently um, on her day off. And I'm just like, Hey, asking questions. So they're getting them, you know, not even on office hours, right. They're getting them when they're not at the office, just because we know that that's what they do, Yeah, you know, get their advice. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump in, um, change the subject a little bit and touch a, a little bit about on your health and how you changed some of the, some conditions that you had with, by changing your diet. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I've had the good fortune of being a registered nurse and being in um, high level academic medical centers and trauma centers, having access to great physicians, dietitians, you name it. But still, when I found myself in trouble, I was having these allergic reactions to everything. I'm a person who usually isn't allergic to anything, but I was allergic to everything. If I walked to my mailbox, I might get a rash or sometimes hives. And I'm trying to figure out what it was. We went through a number of things. And one day, coincidentally, a PA was checking my shins and she found out that I had uh, pain and further tests yielded that I had a really bad vitamin D deficiency, actually adult rickets, which rickets, yeah. who's heard of rickets since we talked about scurvy and rickets is not something <laughs> in the United States. Right, exactly. And so uh, I messed around just trying to get a lot of things set up and I was going into medication after medication it was allergy, it's asthma, it's reflux, it's whatever. So it was one med and then another med to combat that med, to accentuate that med. And I was um, up to something like 14 medications, which is totally ridiculous. Right. But I thought about what can I do? And the more that I read and some people that I knew were really into health. And like you talked about, we talked about earlier being vegan for a while. I do it every January and have done it for a year or so. I decided to go straight to the ground. That's what I call it. When I have something going on, and if I was smart, I would do it all the time. I make sure that I totally change what's going on. I only eat fresh caught, fresh cooked, fresh killed. And so that way there are no preservatives in the link. And I feel quite confident that we have no idea how badly we are affected by the preservatives in food. Most of us are eating vegetables from South America and fruit from Asia. And many things are done to those things in order to make them survive the journey. And then, of course, there's the can. There's the other thing in a package that we rip open. What I found is that when I let go of all of that, my body said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love you. And we're going to show you. <laughs> by getting rid of all these inflammatory symptoms. So my body doesn't like, I'm not, I'm not gluten allergic or, or intolerant, but things that come with gluten and around in that family, pot bread, things like that, don't really like me. I can eat them and I'll gain three pounds. And that is my body showing that it is inflamed. If I do that long term, it's going to simple inflammation to long term and perhaps create a condition. So for me, I was able to change things around with my vitamin D. I did have to do supplementation, but I also got rid of everything else by eating fresh vegetables, eating things that were freshly caught or cooked. Mm -hmm. And I'm just... I'm better. Now I swim for an hour every time I get a chance, uh, three or four times a week. I can walk three or four miles. And I'm not a spring chicken, even though I look like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> At 67, I can tell you. You look fabulous. 
Well, thank you. At 67, I can tell you that I'm in as great a shape or better than I was at 50 because I made those modifications. And it's not about the don'ts. It's about finding what you like, looking at moderation. If I want some cheesecake, I'm having some cheesecake, but I'm not having it every day. I make it special, but I don't deprive myself. But eating better, eating smarter has made all the difference and will probably help me add some years onto my life. Well, and it reduced your medication costs and it reduced the doctor bills and but and even if you're adding a little bit more money to your food and beverage budget, you've reduced your costs other ways. Absolutely. Yeah. I had co-pays for 14 medications. So even wow. if it was $10 a piece, which it wasn't, that would have been 140 I believe I was up to about $400 a month in co-pays at the time. So wow. that was too. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, that's that's a rent of some sort, right? Yeah, that's a vacation in the Caribbean at the end of the year. Well, that is true as well. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, forty eight hundred dollars. Wow, yes, totally. Yeah. And and we have to think about it that way too. So maybe we spend a little bit more on our food, and then we can get a Caribbean vacation instead, right? Yes, yes. and if we plan it out, I actually found that it wasn't costing me more because taking the time to prep that food gave me more food. Actually, I was eating, you know, fresh vegetables take up more space in your belly than processed food will. So I was actually eating less, but higher quality. I could tell in my skin, I could tell in my energy, I could tell in the things that came out of my body as well, that, oh, we like you. We're happy. Thank you so much. Continue to do that. <laughs> Well, I posted um, in the Eating in a Meeting Facebook group, 10 things that I learned or nine things that I learned being vegan in the month. And one is that you are more regular. And I said, and that means going to the bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and that's a good thing because we, our bodies need the fresh vegetables. They need the water and we need to process them out as well. So what is that book? Everybody poops. You know? I don't know, but I know that one of the reasons that we have such high, probability and incidence of colon cancer is because we're not regular because stuff sits in our system for a long, long time. And it's not supposed to, we should be just like our little pets and go once or twice, or maybe even three times a day, but you can tell the difference in the quality, the quantity, the smell, everything. Once you put a lot of vegetables in your system, your poop doesn't stink. Okay. Good to know. Isn't that need, <laughs> that is wonderful? The chlorophyll does it. The chlorophyll does it. It might, but it's not like, oh, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, who was here? Was that me? Oh my God. <laughs> Don't let me eat it again because it died and stayed inside me. So it makes a difference. Wow. That yeah, okay. There's so many conversations that we could have about that. That's interesting. Yeah. And or you you now know who doesn't eat vegetables when you're hanging out with them potentially. <laughs> now, sometimes people can eat beans and it's a whole other right. story. However, in general, I, I had a, a friend who, a female friend who was concerned about her female parts not smelling fresh and what could she do? And so we went to a lot of greens and she even added chlorophyll in the form of gum, et cetera. And her husband was much, much, much happier. Interesting. Okay. And especially since I've seen a commercial for um, and all those things, yeah. deodorant for all of your body parts, right? Yeah. We don't need that. Our bodies are self-cleaning. And if we would just give our bodies what it needs to have, then guess what? They would treat us well. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to also talk about um is you had you you I love the fact that you have your red shirt on, but you planned the heart and red should red dress event. Heart and couple, soul. Say that again. The heart and soul red dress. The event. heart and soul red dress event mm -hmm. um, that helps bring women together for financial, educational, and occupational experiences. But I the story, and it was a question that I asked you: Have you ever had a negative experience with food and beverage? And I thought it was interesting that you said that a woman at my table was trying to eat around the walnuts on 
on a Thunderbird salad because she didn't know she had the right to ask for a different salad. Right. That's so empowering to me. Yes. I was actually shocked. I mean, I grew up in a low resource household. Let's say it as gently as we can. We was po. <laughs> but I grew up without a lot. So we kind of ate the same things all the time. We ate pinto beans and white potatoes and sometimes some biscuits. That's what I lived on. So it's amazing that I'm still here. But that's what we had <laughs> and that's what we did. But as I grew older and as I went into better resources. And especially after I became a registered nurse and I understood the importance of eating better food, then I ate differently. I also celebrate with food. And so I was bringing women of low resources together with women of higher resources to talk about heart disease and having a day where women take care of themselves. I set it up in such a way in um, that they would come and be pampered for an hour and a half. It ended up being about three hours before the event. They would have hair and makeup and oh, that's awesome. Yes. And have caricature artists and lots of networking nails done, all of those things done so that they learn that at least this one day a year, they needed to put themselves first. And in doing so, I made sure that my original budget was not a limiting factor. I had, I don't know, maybe $4,000 to do something with a hundred women. And so basically that's church basement, potato salad, fried chicken kind of situation. But I raised the money and I ended up with 400 women in a very nice event center where we put out beautiful food and made sure it was served with linen, napkins, tablecloths, crystal, and china. And the young woman who just happened to be at my table, I saw her kind of picking at the salad. And I said, oh, if you don't like it, don't worry. We brought women in from shelters, from housing authority. We had the red hatters. So we had all age groups, except it was 18 plus, but we had 18 to 80. And so she says, no, no, I like it, but I, I can't eat nuts. I'm allergic. And I was like, oh, oh my God, stop right now. Stop, stop, stop. And I called the waiter over and said, please bring me a salad without nuts, which he immediately brought back. And she was just kind of shocked. And I asked, what's, what's wrong? And she said, oh, I didn't know you could send your food back. She thought that she just had to eat around it. And so when you talk about bringing people to the table, mm -hmm. we had not been brought to the table, even though we didn't have anything. We still had a tablecloth. We had some china. I don't know who had been passed down from or it was, you know, just so special to us that we treated it appropriately. But we set the table. We did all of those things. And she did not know any of that. And so I came to recognize that even though I had managed to get them to the table, we sent, we got limousine companies to go pick them up in the big limo buses. And some came in the like SUV limos uh -huh. just to give them a real special day. I still didn't realize that I hadn't bridged all the gaps that there are. They didn't know what good food looked like necessarily. Mm -hmm. didn't know that it was not only their right, but their responsibility to say, this will hurt me and not try to work around it. I, and there's somebody online, my friend Leanne has been posting about bullying around food allergies and, and all the jokes that happen about food allergies. And, and just what you just said is like, this will hurt me. Mm -hmm. This will potentially kill me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to allow them, you know, us to be able to say that without being bullied or without being disregarded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember being on a plane and as speakers, we're always out there. We're on the run. I was getting, you know, 100,000 miles a year on one or two airlines every year. I was accustomed to going up to first class and having something decent, but First class isn't the same anymore. No. Boo, yes. <laughs> but anyway, I was sitting in the back and I now I always prep for when I travel. I'll have some nuts. I'll have some cut pineapple. I'll have a few things that I can eat regardless to whether or not I have time to stop in the airport. If there's anything worth eating there. 
And I was just about to eat my nuts and the lady came, you know, kind of, excuse me, excuse me. And I looked over and she said, please don't eat those. And I was like, what are you talking about? She said, don't eat those nuts. I'm allergic. And I thought, at first I was really like, I don't care. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm a better person than that. But I was thinking, I am starving to death and these nuts are all I have. But sure enough, I said, well, good for you. Good for you for saying, look, that might hurt me because we know that nut allergies are just super bad that, and, you right. know, nut dust in the air and breathe it in and, and have an emergency. So I, I asked the flight attendant, what do you do? I know you've stopped serving nuts, but do you make an announcement that there's somebody on the flight with an allergy or please identify if you are so we can try to do that? And she was like, no, we don't do that. I said, well, what about for the other people who might need some food? What if I'm a diabetic? Can you just decide you're not going to give anything? But I was expecting I could at least get some crackers or something. Right. Oh, we didn't think about that. But I know some of the airlines have changed their policies about making sure there's something on board and to try to bridge the gap between potentially hurting someone and giving you some snacks that you're not mean to the flight attendants. Yeah, it, it is a it is a big conundrum with airlines as well as at events as well. So how do you balance them all out? Because a large number of people have a larger number of people actually have different dietary needs. It is. Um, how do you, you know, figure it out? But I think it's, it comes down to that respect, mm -hmm. right? And even though I tell you, um, and you should be telling the airline in advance before you get there so that you have some backup in, in talking to the flight attendants. And unfortunately, some people have had some bad experiences with flight crews mm -hmm. on that. But, you know, but being conscientious and, and communicating and, and owning yourself, right? But mm -hmm. then also giving hopefully the people who are hearing it, if they do hear it, um, are respectful. Yeah. Yes. So I know you've you have got to run because you're giving back to the community today. Yes. And I want to thank you again for being on here and being a registered nurse and doing the work that you do. Thank you so much. It is indeed my pleasure, and I hope that everyone who's listening will pay attention to the things that keep them healthy. Just take the time for yourself. Get out. Give yourself 30 minutes a day to relax and get some fresh air if possible. Eat the best foods that you can afford and get good sleep and make sure you have love in your life. Oh, I, that's a great, having love in your life is super important. And I just posted your website um, in the comments below so everybody can find you at valdeford.com. And um, one last question before you leave. Do you have a favorite food or beverage? Oh, my favorite food is basically it's going to be butter pecan ice cream. I don't oh, know. Oh, yummy the age that I love it. But really right now, I really love experiencing new fruits and vegetables and grains and learning how great they taste after being a longtime carnivore. Yep. And, and I learned that over this month, you know, there, there's so many versatile things to do with fruits and vegetables and nuts and grains and stuff versus just steaming some broccoli, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you, Valda. I look forward to catching up soon. Hopefully well, I'll get to see you when I'm driving through Greensboro so. on know. the way to Charlotte. Yeah. And everyone stay tuned. I've got another guest coming on right after this. Um, my friend, Jennifer Hill Booker, but Valda Ford, thank you for your service. It's my pleasure. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, so as I said, I've got another guest coming on to the show. It's a double double duty this week. I'm so excited to welcome my friend, chef and author, cookbook author, Jennifer Hill Booker. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Hello, hello. Let me get situated. Make sure you can see me. I can see you just fine. I can see you. Okay. Um, you're a little blurry, but I think we can work with that. Well, let's see. Let's see. It could be my camera. I've been moving and shaking, so let's see what we got. Is that better? Oh, it's much better. Oh, that's much better. Yes. Yes. 
Wow. Um, okay, so Jennifer, you're coming f- to us from your house in Atlanta, right? Yes, I am currently in uh, Lilburn, but yes, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And um, I wanted to get you on the show today because you're about to go on a cruise. <laughs> I am, and um, not just for leisure, but actually as a guest chef for uh, Windstar Cruise Line, who has partnered with the James Beard Foundation and invited um, James Beard affiliated chefs to be the guest chef on some of their uh, their cruise liners. That is so exciting. And all right, I can hear myself behind you. Can I don't know how to fix that on your end, but um, so this is it's really exciting what they're doing, and it's uh, well a couple of things. Can you explain to people what the James Beard Foundation is first? Yeah, for sure thing. So James Beard Foundation is an organization that really focuses on um, food equality uh, within the food system, and that's from. Everyone, front of the house, back of the house, line cooks, dishwashers, chefs, restaurant owners, food truck owners, um, just making sure that there's equity across the board. Uh, They really push sustainability and the choices of produce, seafood, meats that we choose. And uh, they really are an advocate for food justice. And then for myself, I'm one of their impact fellows, which is uh, for no waste. And what that means is running a full use kitchen or really trying to use every part of everything that we eat to to the nth degree, you know. So um, it's an organization I've been involved with for years and trust and and admire. Well, and they do some really good work. Yes, I think so. The the. One of the things that you said before the show um, in in my guest form was that one of the negative situations that you see in the kitchen is knowing that food is being wasted just to achieve a look. Yes. Can you talk about that? Sure. And I think um, a lot of the restaurants are kind of getting away from that, um, mainly because we're having such a hard time in the food service industry. So, you know, we're grabbing onto every single penny which means getting as much yield as we can from every ingredient. Um, but if you think back, I guess early 2000s and you know below, it was what does food look like on the plate and that kind of avant-garde look and one pea, one piece of celery and a tiny little chicken, you know, whatever. Um, and then a lot of those cuts to create that super linear line or that one little cube, uh, unfortunately, some of the other waste of that would end up in the trash. And I know people say, oh, but I compost, but that's also the trash at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. So um, to achieve that look, a lot of food was wasted. And I think we're getting away from that as consumers saying, hey, we don't need that. And then of course, as the chefs saying that we're not going to present that. So it's, it's kind of finding its way full circle as far as sustainability goes. That's a great idea. And then we also have to address the restaurants that give us four times as much food that we need to eat then. Although, but, but still making that one serving look hearty because sometimes you get it and you're like, that's all I get, Mm, you know? True. And it's a fine line, right? It's a fine line of economics for the, the restaurant, the, the establishment for the consumer that may say, Hey, this is, a meal that I need to stretch for two meals. Um, so how do what does that look like? And I've talked about this um, concern with other chefs and like, what do we do as that front of the house person? Do I say, hey, it's okay to have a half order? Because people who dine know that if you wanted to split a plate, like Tracy, if you and I went for lunch and we're like, we're going to split this entree, they upcharge you for that convenience, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you have too much food. But saying, hey, um, you could do a half order if you want to and making a customer feel okay doing that. And it's not a big deal. It's not a big spectacle. Um, And also just doing smaller portions that are maybe more than we should have if you look at a diet pyramid, right? But not so much that all we do is pack it up, take it home and throw it in the trash anyway, which often happens. Leftovers in general. People forget that they're in there. They true. Yeah. They do. Especially, people... 
Yeah, whether that's the leftovers from home or the leftovers from the restaurant, right? Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, okay, so I've known you for a long time, and you actually nominated me to be a La Dame de Escoffier, so thank you very much. You're welcome. And what, one of the phrases that I, you know, I found on your website, but I think I've known as well, is that you want food or you feel and think and know that food should taste like food. Can you explain that to me? Because there's just a lot of things that are prepackaged that don't. <laughs> yes. So when I say food should taste like food, and to be honest, I heard this from a fellow chef, uh, John Canadu, when we talked together at La Cordon Bleu um, Culinary School in Tucker, Georgia. And so we would, you know, the students would make their dish, uh, their assignment for the day, and he's like, food should taste like food which means it doesn't need to be over seasoned or over sauced or made to taste like something, but it should taste like its natural state. A carrot should taste like a carrot. Um, an onion should taste like an onion. Pineapple should taste like pineapple. Um, and in the less processing, which means the less salting or maybe the less preserving, the less cooking, definitely the less packaging that you can do, is ultimately what you want to do to have that dish taste like it's its true form. That's it's really really important, and especially I think we can see that a lot more when people are looking at the plant based options, um, and and eating more plant based and vegan. If you want to put that word onto it as well, there's a big contention between those two words sometimes, but I think it helps bring that out. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think you, you're right about the whole vegan or that title or that label um, gets people's dander up. And I think because it came out or maybe it was perceived, perhaps introduced as a very elitist um, title, right? It was, I can only eat or I only eat. And so people perceive that as, okay, you're doing a little That's too true. much. But when you say, it, hey, I'm just plant-based, I do all plants or I do 90% plant-based, then we all settle down, you know, say, okay, I can respect that. And I, I can see that. And my daughter told me a joke years ago. She goes, how can you tell a person is a vegan? I'm like, how? She goes, they'll tell you. And I was like, and there <laughs> lies the problem. <laughs> now, now, you have a couple of cookbooks. Mm -hmm which one is somewhere in my house. I probably should have found it before I had you on here. Um, and it's, it's good Southern food. I mean, you grew up in the South, right? Yes. So talk about your Southern roots and what that food means to you. Sure. I, I have to always preface it with Southern cuisine gets a bad rap. And for whatever reason, the assumption is we're all grease and gravy. And that is absolutely not true. Um, you know, I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, um, Alabama, Georgia. We're all in a G, or probably A6 uh, growing season, which means we get to grow produce pretty much all year round. And you have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And they're inexpensive, especially if you're growing them yourself, like our family did. Um, so you have that, and that's what you eat. You eat what you grow and what you have. So you may have lots of greens and beans and string beans and potatoes and fruits, and yes, you may add like a smoked meat to it, um, but not very much. And you also add in the, the fact that meat or protein is more expensive than the vegetable, so it tended to be less you know, heavy protein and more vegetable forward. So that's what I grew up on and absolutely love it. We always had at least two cooked vegetables and a salad for every meal. And I've duplicated that for my family. Um, and we have just beautiful um, abundance of produce. We set a very beautiful table. And occasionally we have some fried chicken or some macaroni and cheese. But uh, it truly is not an everyday occurrence. No one can survive <laughs> on that type of diet for very long. Well, and Valda, who was just on, <clears throat> excuse me, was saying that there's such a variety with the fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and the different flavors that you can bring out with them, you know, whether it's a grain or a vegetable or a fruit, it's not just steaming it. True. True. I mean, I love roasting um, vegetables in the fall and winter. 
Uh, I feel like it helps heat the house, right? I have to cook anyway. Um, it really caramelizes, so it brings out the natural sugar in that vegetable. Um, it adds some texture because it gets nice and crisp. It changes the color, so you have some variety, you know, eat with our eyes. In the summer and spring, I do the same thing, but on the grill. So you get that smokiness, you still get the caramelization, but you can tease out a lot of flavors from your fruits and vegetables. And don't be shy about grilling fruit. I mean, grilled pineapple is delightful. Um, grilled plums, believe it or not, peaches are really good. I try grilled watermelon. It gets a little soggy, but, you know, you can kind of <laughs> finesse it, play around a little bit. That's interesting. I never heard of grilling um, watermelon. I've seen the pineapple and and peaches, especially at Cook's Warehouse. We've we've done grilled peaches at Cook's Warehouse. Yes. Um, so you you mentioned sustainability and the the James Beard stuff and food waste. So food waste, but then also eating sustainably. And you mentioned that we Georgia can grow um, year round. So can you talk about how you can incorporate different? the seasons into your menu planning? Oh, for sure. And I'll be honest. Um, so I first started eating seasonally, um, you know, as a child, because that's just how we ate and we ate what we grew. So it came in each season. And then when I started my own family, uh, what was in season was always least expensive. So when you're, you know, you have a budget, you know, new husband, new home or new partner, or even just solo, your money for food may be very fixed. So you look and see what's on sale. And the produce that's in season is going to be less expensive than out of season. And so that's really what started me eating seasonally. I would pick up the newspaper ad or go online and see what's on sale. And then I planned my menu. Once I planned my menu, then I found my recipes. A lot of people do it the other way around. They plan, they plan this menu of all these great things uh, that they want to eat. Uh, then they find these recipes, right? And then they go grocery shop and they find that it's very expensive or it's difficult to find. It's not in season. It's not sustainable. For example, salmon. Can we like, we're going to have to let that go. Um, but flip <laughs> it around. See what's in season. See what's on sale. Then plan your menu. Then go grocery shop. It'll be less expensive. It's more nutritious if it comes from 20 miles down the road at a farm versus, you know, 20,000 miles across the sea. So give that some some thought as well, the nutritional value of, of what you're eating. Well, I, I love that as well. And when we're talking about, Valda mentioned um, individuals with lower resources as well, but some people in general don't know how to cook those mm. vegetables, you know, or, you know, they're, they're going to that and they're seeing these seasonal things. I'm like, when I first moved to Georgia, I have to admit, I had never eaten a collard green and okay. my neighbors across the street, you know, steamed them with the red pepper and the vinegar. And I'm like, Oh my God, I could eat these for days. And I call my mom. I'm like, why have you never made collard greens before? <laughs> but it wasn't necessarily where we lived. Right. Right. But right. in Georgia, it's a big staple. It is. Well, I would say nowadays with, and this is good and bad, but the internet, right? The World Wide Web. So many cooking videos on YouTube or individual blogs. Um, take a look and kind of see what's out there. I won't say everyone is a legit recipe because they don't all work. But if you're watching the video, you kind of get an idea of, okay, that looks like something I could try or something I can do. So if you run across, let's say a rutabaga, and you're like, I have no clue what this is. Google rutabaga, see some videos on how they prepare it, look at the comments, I always do that, and, and then try it out. And you're not investing too much money on that one produce item, and you might find something that you really enjoy that you've never had before. That's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever cooked with rutabaga before. I know it was, never mind, I won't go there. It was a college drinking game, but you had oh, to pick no. vegetables without showing your teeth. Oh, no. My friend Sharon always picked that vegetable. I'm like, what is that? Yes. yes. Um, okay, so let's just go back to the wind, um, the Windstar cruises for a second. Mm -hmm. I, you, so you're going on an eight day cruise. Yes. And you're the guest culinary, sh the guest chef. 
mm -hmm. for that cruise. But I love the fact that all three this season are all women. Yes, I'm super excited about that. Um, so uh, I, was, I was geared up to go as a guest chef, I, 2020? Anyway, before the world imploded, right? <laughs> and so, you know, like everyone, there were so many changes and disappointments, et cetera. And so when they called this uh, year, honestly, it was like in January, like, hey, we're gearing up for the cruises. Would you be interested to go? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I think it was because I didn't want to get excited and then to be disappointed again. Uh, but then I was like, yes, let's do it. They're like, we're only doing three this year. So, and I was like, okay, I'm in. And then I saw that um, Tanya and Lee are also going. So I'm super excited that we've got some girl power. Um, a nice, diverse group of ladies and going some different places on the globe. So I, I am super stoked. And you're going to the Caribbean, right? I am. But uh, luckily for me, a part that I've never been to. So we're doing uh, kicking off from Aruba, then Colombia, then Costa Rica and finishing in Panama. And to show perhaps, you know, my romantic side, we're stopping in Cartagena, which if you've ever seen Romancing the Stone, <laughs> right? Like, so I'm so excited about that. <laughs> More than the food, even. I'm like, so excited to go to this town. <laughs> Do some dancing. There you yep. go. Yeah, there exactly. You go. Now, with when, because you're going to do some culinary demos on there, are you going to try to tie what you know your Southern food into some of those flavors? How, what I are you going to do with that? Well, the cool thing about the um, Windstar Cruise Line is they want the chefs to cook our brand of food, right, our voice, but also using local ingredients. So okay. I went, I talked with executive chef Peter Tobler, and we kind of went back and forth. And I said, well, this is what I'd like to cook. And he's like, okay, well, this is what is, is available. And so we kind of played that game and came up with dishes that really speak to my Southern and French culinary um, style and incorporating ingredients along the way as we go through the Caribbean. So for example, I'm doing a citrus brined shrimp. And so okay. obviously we're in the Caribbean, so we'll have fresh seafood, we'll have fresh citrus. Um, I spent some time growing up in Florida, so that speaks to my experience there. Um, we're doing some short ribs and potatoes and grits. So you're kind of getting really into that Southern um, hearty dish. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just very pleased at how they, they incorporate local, sustainable, seasonal with the chef's own brand of cooking. That's very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I mean, that would be a lot of, a, a lot of fun to do and, and taste that stuff, taste that food. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the, I want to talk about sustainability wise, because I saw on Instagram, you're opening up a restaurant and we talked about this the other day. Yes. You're moving to Arkansas. Yes. Um, and so, but the one thing that I, we were talking about sustainability and you open your restaurant, you, because it's going to be a beer garden, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you said about the bottles, you want to talk, share that story? Oh yes. My business partner is probably going to kill me. So we were <laughs> planning the menu and it's very traditional. Um, Brats and sausages, um, pretzels. We'll do our own pickles and sauerkraut and uh, French fries. But then we're also doing European um, and German beers. My partner's from Wisconsin. Hey, Dan. And so he wants to do some Wisconsin beers. So we were talking about we'll have some things on keg. We'll have some wines on keg. Um, we'll have some cans and then bottles. And I was like, well, does Arkansas recycle glass. And he's like, well, no, I mean, they do, but it's not something they pick up with the recycling. So we have to take it somewhere if we want to recycle it. And I was like, well, I'm not real comfortable with that part of having all this glass unless we set up a plan where it goes in a certain bin and we are responsible to take it um, to be recycled. Because if we really are want to be and plan to be this restaurant that believes in sustainability food-wise and taking care of the world and our earth, we have to, you know, if we're going to talk the talk, we have to walk the walk. And so that made us think, well, perhaps we'll shift the vessel that the beer comes in, maybe less glass, more aluminum that can be recycled, or even the kegs, which is better because then they can truly be cleaned and, 
and refilled. So it's something to think about that I never really considered um, before before looking into the recycling um, system. Well, and we talked about how Decatur, Georgia and Atlanta had Atlanta has stopped recycling glass mm -hmm. when I was mm -hmm. there. And so that is a big issue. But I'm like, I also think that meeting planners should look at that too. I'm like, what mm -hmm. are you offering on your bars, your event bars? Don't order the the beer or the beer in the bottles, right? Make it just the aluminum. That's what true. Can do well, you know, and sorry to cut you off, but you're absolutely right. And I, I didn't think about it when I saw an influx of um, canned wine. Remember that first started and you mm -hmm. could get wine in the can. I was like, well, oh, is it really going to taste right? Not looking at it in a sustainable, recyclable way, looking at it in a, in a taste and traditional way. But I, I agree. We have the power of the people who offer our, our, our goods. And of course, the consumer who purchases the goods, you very much have the power, the power with your dollar. So you can say, hey, I love a really good German beer, but I'm not comfortable with it coming in the bottle. What are the other alternatives? And I think if we all do that, then it'll force us to look and see what the alternatives are and perhaps even push our counties into re, um, visiting recycling glass. Exactly. Now, what about, I mean, you're in Arkansas. Do they have a growing season like Georgia does? Um, it's not as long as ours, but it is robust. So okay. I'm excited about that. It's cool because I'll get to learn some new, sorry, you hear our, our dog in the back. She thinks she's the <laughs> boss of the neighborhood. But uh, I'll get to know or learn some new produce. Um, for example, they have uh, what they call black apples. And that's huge in um, Arkansas. And they have apple ciders that they make out of and traditional apple cake and, and all of those things. So we'll definitely plan to incorporate uh, what grows there uh, naturally into our, our, our menus. All right. I'm going to have to Google black apples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's a really good flavor. It's like tart and a little bit sweet. So it's not overly sweet. Um, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I looked on your bio, which I didn't know about you, is that uh, you well. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you did some cooking for the culinary th culinary therapy for the cottages on Mountain Creek. I did. I did. So I enjoy cooking. Like when people ask, hey, what do you do for fun or your free time? And so my top three are reading, um, traveling and cooking. And I find it very therapeutic. And this is me cooking, you know, some music, barefoot, maybe a glass of wine. So it's different than on the hotline. Um, but I found that it also gives people a sense of accomplishment because you're cooking food, you're providing a meal for yourself and for your family. And that's something that no one can ever take away from you. And when people are suffering with mental illness, and sometimes that means they have uh, difficulty making a decision or, you know, staying present or feeling positive about themselves, I found that if they can make a dish, even something very simple, it makes them feel like they've accomplished something. And then they get to eat that dish, right? And all of those great feelings and those tastes and those textures also help lighten their mood. And so I did some work with the cottages. I think I was there maybe four years and, uh, and really enjoyed the experience. And I, and I stopped doing it because it is a heavy, a heavy job to see the clients that flourish, you feel good about, and those that really maybe don't flourish as well. And so I had to stop for a while because it was, it was a heavy job. Well, and, and it reminds me of some stories that I've seen of, um, and there, I think he's in Wisconsin and he's mm -hmm. helping inmates, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 they learn to cook in, mm -hmm in prison and it brings them out and that actually gives them a career after the fact. So I think tying those, the mentality uh, and the, the thoughtfulness that comes with making food for right. others really can help in a variety of ways. I agree. I have a friend chef, um, Jimmy in Michigan, and that's what he does. He's a, an executive chef at a men's prison and he teaches um, them to cook. And then once they're released, they have that skill. And again, you can provide for yourself, you can provide for your family, you can make a living. And that is majorly empowering. Well, 100%. I mean, when you know how to do something besides a bag, you know, a mm -hmm. bag of peas or whatever, it, it does, it, 
it, even growing it. And I, I think, gender, you know, looking in and doing the gardens through slow mm -hmm. foods, you know, kids mm -hmm. learn where their food comes from and they're growing it and they feel like so much more empowered that they're doing something that they're going to put in their bodies. Oh, absolutely. I think that ties into what you just said, right? The empowerment of, and the wonder of taking that one little seed and growing it up to this big head of broccoli and then cooking that broccoli for dinner. For a kid who's like, I don't eat vegetables, to one who's like, I want to eat that vegetable, you know, every day. That's huge. Right, because I made it. I made it, absolutely. Okay, so I mentioned earlier um, La Dame de Scoffier, and you are the president of the Atlanta chapter now, right? I am. First uh, Black president that we've had at our chapter, so I'm very, very honored to, to hold the position. That is awesome. So can you tell some people about what La Dame's is and what the Atlanta chapter is renowned for raising a lot of money to send women um, to get culinary careers? So you can Absolutely. talk about that a little bit. Sure. So La Dame's Escoffier uh, was created to elevate and empower women in the food service industry. And uh, so we do that through uh, networking. Um, we also do it through education. And we raise, as, as Tracy is saying, we usually have our one big event and that'll change this year. We're going to do two big events, um, but we raise money for scholarship. And this is to send young women to culinary school and get them a boost into the food service industry. And uh, we had our, um, our meeting yesterday for the executive board. And I shared with my board that um, after my undergrad, I went to culinary school on scholarship. And then when I lived in uh, Europe, I went to Le Cordon Bleu in Paris for a year. And part of that was scholarship. And without those scholarship funds, that would have never happened. And who knows if I would be sitting here with you today having this conversation about, you know, culinary. So it, it's, it's huge. And uh, it is a, a big um, chapter. I think we're at 126 women. Um, we've changed the membership um, requirements. It used to be invitation only, but we found internationally that that may limit to some of the ladies that know we exist and us meeting those ladies. So now it's an open membership where if you want to be involved in this organization, you can apply for membership. Um, it's still a selection process, but you don't have to sit in the corner and wait to be invited anymore. I have so many names here in North Carolina that I want to add. You, you know, to become members because um, we can grow. And and I know Afternoon in the Country, which is the big Atlanta fundraiser, um, which was a great food festival mm -hmm. that we did, you know, raised what, $80,000 every year? At least 80. I think at our, yeah. our, our lowest year was 80,000, but it tends to be more than that. So it, it was a huge um, fundraiser. It really, really did... Uh, beef up our scholarship funds. And of course, COVID hit. So that kind of, you know, quieted everything down. But this year, we're excited to say we're planning two events. And I won't be premature to announce them because we're still tightening mm -hmm. up some of the details. But we're looking for a nice uh, fundraising event in May, and then another in November. And both okay, will be good. for scholarship. And, you know, listening, having been there, so when some of the scholarship winners came back, I mean, mm -hmm. it just brings tears to your eyes how, I'm going to do it now too, you know, <laughs> what we provided them, kind of like you yes. said, you know, yes. you would not be here today without those. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's huge and, and we all can pay it forward, right? We, no one mm -hmm. is where they are in a vacuum alone. Someone has advocated for you, even if you don't know that someone's name. And why not right. do that mm -hmm. for the next person, you know, the next generation, or even the person standing right next to you? Like, let's all right. advocate mm -hmm. for one another and pay it forward for one another. So I have a question a little bit about women in the kitchen and women in this field. You know, La Dame's has been around for a while, but I think we see a lot more women in the news, in the culinary field out there. Do you, what do you see going forward for women being in more prominent positions in mm. the industry? I think um, it will happen as we continue to push and demand that it happens. It hasn't happened because 
um, this organization or this establishment that is male dominated said, hey, let's give the girls a chance. It's happened because very talented and tenacious women are just continuously pushing and pushing and pushing and paying it forward for the woman right behind them. And so I think that as that continues, you will see um, more women in positions of, um, I don't want to say power, but perhaps they're the ones that are, are setting the table and inviting other ladies to have a seat at the table, which doesn't really happen the way it's been set up. Okay. Well, I'm encouraged by that. And I, I know the work that we do in La Dame's tries to help encourage that as well. So keep up what you're doing. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. So what to end it out, um, somebody actually, I don't know if it was you or not, posted the address for the new restaurant. Oh, um, so I did is, not, but whoever that is, thank you very much. <laughs> yep. So that is posted in the in the chat. Nice. Um, I did post out your social media so everybody can figure out where you are and, and watch you on this cruise thank and, you. and other times as well, of <laughs> course. But um, my final question to you is what is your favorite food and beverage? Oh, gosh. I heard you ask um, your last guest. Valda, and yeah. Valda, and I was thinking about that. Um, my favorite beverage. I like a good old-fashioned. Okay. But my, like, I don't want to say my go-to because that makes me sound like I'm a lush, but I do like a crisp gin and tonic with extra lime. Okay. Um, Food-wise, I like savory and salty. So if you give me... Uh, cheese and charcuterie and some really great bread. Um, I'm happy. I have zero complaints. Yes. That goes really a little bit with your French culinary training too. That's true. I think it's a natural, <laughs> it's a natural pairing. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to have you come back after yes. the cruise to talk yes. about how the experience was and um, and learn, you know, cause I've, I've been on big cruise ships, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't one there with a, guest chef so i'm interested in hearing how it goes well i'm excited i mean these are small cruise uh yachts i guess they're called and i'm on one of the larger ones windsurf and it's um only 312 guests so okay. that makes me feel comfortable um as far as health wise but also i'm i'm there for the luxury so i will be reporting back when i get back <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. And everybody check out the chat. This is Chef Jennifer Booker, yes. um, currently in Atlanta, soon to be from Arkansas. Yes. And um, um, I'll make sure that everybody's got to gets to know how to get a hold of you. So thank you. You're welcome, Jennifer. Um, until next time, everyone stay safe and eat well. And we will see you next week. Yes. Bye. Bye.